Thank you for joining Red Deer Public Library's author event with Melody Warnick. We're waiting for everyone to join and we will begin in a few moments. This event is the happy ending to a year of challenges based on the book, This Is Where You Belong by Melody Warnick. I'm Kimberly and I work for Red Deer Public Library. Working for a library, a number of good books come across my way. One of these was Melody Warnick's book, This Is Where You Belong. I thought this was a good book for a community read. So beginning in January, 2020, Red Deer Public Library started a program called Dear Red Deer, and it was based on this book. We read a chapter of the book and set challenges every month based on that chapter. Then we met in the library or posted on social media to share experiences. We hoped that by taking part in this program, we would come to love Red Deer and feel like this is where we belong. We asked Melody's question, what if a place becomes the right place only by our choosing to love it? The library has multiple copies of the book, which have been borrowed many times. And I think the book was a spark for this community. We're so pleased Melody is sharing her time and expertise with us. As a freelance writer, her articles appear in publications like the New York Times and in her newsletter, which you can subscribe to. This is Where You Belong is her first book, but there are rumors that a second book is in the works. She lives happily in Blacksburg, Virginia, so we will assume that those Love Where You Live experiments have worked for her. So you may have been part of Dear Reggie from the start, you may have come into the conversation in the middle, or you may not have read the book yet. Wherever you come in, thank you for joining the conversation with author Melody Warnick. Thank you, Melody. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to speak um, at the Red Deer Public Library without actually being in Canada. Um, I'm in my home office right now. Um, and uh, as was mentioned, I am in Blacksburg, Virginia, which if you've read the book is a little bit of a spoiler. And I feel like I should just get it out there right now. Um, I wrote the book, This Is Where You Belong, as a very personal journey. My husband got a job um, in Blacksburg, Virginia, working at Virginia Tech in 2012. And so my family moved to Blacksburg um, and it was our sixth move and our fifth state in about 12 or 13 years. So we came here with this sense of, you know, we are going to love it here. That was sort of how I handled every move that I ever made, um, was thinking, you know, this is the move that's going to change my life. I, I had a little bit of magical thinking about moves and places. And I thought if I, if I landed in the right place, everything in my life would be better. And, and that's what I thought about Blacksburg. I, I thought, you know, this place is going to be Mayberry, it's this small southern town, and we're just going to love it. We're going to get to know all our neighbors. We're going to plant a garden. We're, we're going to sit on the porch and drink lemonade. I had really high expectations for what would be different about my life in Blacksburg um, until the moment that I got here. And I was reminded of a couple things. First, that moving always sucks. I, I don't know how many of you have done this recently or, or how often, but it's a period of chaos and having your life turned upside down. And it's almost never fun. Um, but second was I had come to a community where I didn't know anyone and I didn't know anything about this place. And I was having to reconstruct my life from scratch in this new town. And because I had been fairly ge geographically mobile, my response to this was, okay, um, we tried for about a month, it didn't work. 
let's just move on again. Uh, but because we had just moved, my kids were starting a brand new school. I didn't want to have massive future therapy bills. I knew I had to figure out how to love this place that I had landed. And that was the motivation for writing This Is Where You Belong. It was my attempt to grapple with what it feels like to be a newcomer in a place, what it feels like to adjust to a new community, to try and love it, even if you feel like you don't fit in there. Um, and the spoiler is that uh, it worked. <laughs> and, and I'm still in Blacksburg. It's been about um, eight and a half years since my family moved here. And we, we have made this our home and we love it. But it hasn't been without ups and downs. And that's a little of what I wanted to talk to you about today. And I want to take you back to the moment, uh, probably in early to mid-March, when you first realized that the world was falling apart. I think we all have that moment, right? Um, it's sort of the modern day equivalent of hearing that JFK was shot or something. The moment that you heard that coronavirus was shutting down almost everything in your town. I'm not sure if things went down in, in your area quite the same way that they went down in mine, but we had known for a little while, a few weeks, that maybe this was coming. There had been rumblings about this pandemic and rumors that maybe the schools would shut. And my husband and I decided that we were going to have like our, our last night on earth moment. We were gonna go on a date um, and we were gonna go to downtown Blacksburg. So we went, we saw a movie at The Lyric, which is this nonprofit historic movie theater in our town's downtown. And then we crossed the street and we went to a restaurant called The Cellar. If you recall, um, this was actually Friday the 13th. <laughs> so we go into this restaurant, there's you know some TV screens on the walls and all the TV screens are showing the movie Friday the 13th, which I had never seen and never wanted to see, but it was like this mood for the whole country, right? Something bad is happening. I was watching these, you know, camp counselors running through the woods screaming as they were, you know, chased by a maniac with an ax. And that felt like the current mood for the whole country that something really terrifying was coming and it was chasing us. And we were probably gonna get murdered in the end. Uh, it was a stressful night. And then you know the rest of the story within a couple days, everything started shutting down. First, the schools and then the restaurants. And in our town, places like the library shut down. Um, when you have these moments uh, of seeing everything in your community kind of come to a temporary end, it really puts things in perspective. At least it did for me. I, I was reminded of how much I value these things in my town. I value having restaurants to go to. I value having a library uh, more than anything. Uh, I value having a historic movie theater to go to. And all of a sudden, all those things were gone. What are our towns when those things are missing? I, I think uh, we got the answer uh, fairly quickly. Um, part of it was the fact that if you were anything like me, you may be worried about your community and its survival. And um, you wondered if we'd ever make it through. And the silver lining of that um, is that that's a good thing. <laughs> the fact that you were maybe worried about your community and the people in your community means that you are place attached. Um, back when I first moved to Blacksburg and I realized that I didn't love this town, but that I was probably gonna be here for a while and I needed to figure out some sort of relationship with it. Um, because I've been a freelance writer for most of my career, my response to those moments is I'm gonna dig into 
what the research tells me about it. And that's what I did. And I came across this idea called place attachment. Place attachment was the word that some sociologists and psychologists and scientists used to describe that feeling of being deeply at home in a place. Um, that feeling of this is where I belong. That this is my place. These are my people. I want to be here. Um, and it sounds sort of touchy feely and it is, but it turned out to have all these positive benefits too, that uh, people who were place attached had higher levels of well-being. They were physically healthier, less likely to have a heart attack and stroke. They were simply more content in all areas of their lives. I wondered if you could manufacture place attachment. If you don't already feel that, can you make that happen for yourself? Uh, and that kind of drove my plan in Blacksburg. I developed what I called love where you live experiments. It sounds like these might be similar to some of the experiments that you've done in your town over the last year or so. For me, I realized that there were actions that were correlated with place attachment, that people who are place attached simply behave a little differently in their communities. They're more likely to do things like volunteer, more likely to be civically engaged, more likely to have good relationships with their neighbors. So my thought in my early days of Blacksburg was, I'm not really feeling it right now, but maybe I can manufacture that feeling by taking these actions. So I devised love where you live experiments, which I described to people as sort of like micro action steps that I took in Blacksburg and that anyone can take wherever they live. Um, things like I volunteered at that nonprofit historic movie theater, The Lyric. Um, I shopped at the farmer's market because there's a lot of research that shows that farmer's markets improve social capital and help us develop relationships with people in our community. I got to know my neighbors. I took banana muffins around, um, which sounds like the ultimate cheesy thing to do, but actually helped me get to know the people who lived on my street. And then I started inviting them over to my house for dinner. Um, I did other things like attend a local football game because I realized that Every town, no matter how small, has things that it excels at, things that it's proud of. And if you want to be place attached and feel part of your community, you do the things that your community is good at. In my college town, that was college football. And even though I do not care about football and I know very little about it, I started attending some Virginia Tech Hokie games. And I, I learned that in some ways, place attachment bears a lot of resemblance to sports fandom. You have that feeling of we're in this together, that my team or my town is an extension of me. It represents me. It's something called place identity that we start to, when we are really attached, start to tie our sense of self into our place. I also did things that I knew would be helpful, not just for me, but for my community. And that was stuff like shop at local businesses. Um, one of my toughest experiments was trying to become a local, uh, a regular at a local restaurant. I had read a lot of research about third places, which is the, this idea that there are places in our lives that aren't home and they're not work. They're third places, restaurants or bars or game rooms or things like that, that make us feel really connected to our community. I had never had that. Uh, and I kind of wanted it. Uh, so I thought I could create it for myself. And I wanted to read you a section of my book from the chapter about eating local food, that it is um, about one, <laughs> one of these attempts to become a regular at a local restaurant. After some back and forth, we settled on Lefty's Main Street Grill, a slightly upscale restaurant in a former Long John Silver's on Main Street. The menu was a zany, multicultural mix of burgers, shrimp and grits, steak au poivre, and Caribbean salmon. 
I was already in love with their cashew chicken sandwich slathered with pesto and golden raisins. We could walk there in 10 minutes. Lefties existed at the just right confluence of convenience and craving, and only in Blacksburg, unlike, say, the gas station subway. For our first official visit under the auspices of the Love Where You Live experiment, we grabbed a table under the framed pictures of famous left-handers, Bill Clinton, Beethoven, Ned Flanders, and ordered everything from a chips and guac appetizer to an apple cinnamon bread pudding. Elliot Smith and Counting Crows played on the stereo. Every time our waitress, a college girl in short shorts, swerved through the overcrowded dining room toward us, we beamed up at her giddy for approval and recognition. By the second visit, I could tell we'd made a miscalculation. Mark Rosenbaum, the marketing professor, had told me that the employees who were most likely to engage their customers and become part of their social network averaged 16 years working at the restaurant. So if you've got a transient employee staff, you're not gonna have a third place. No one working at lefties from the waiters to the chefs wielding saute pans in the kitchen looked to be over the age of 25. An ever rotating cast of college students took our orders. They were perfectly nice, but never the same person twice. <clears throat> because lefties was a seat yourself establishment, we couldn't even request to sit in a particular server's area. One drizzly Friday night, we grabbed a table only to realize that we were being served by a new guy in plaid Bermuda shorts, while last week's waitress hovered at the table next to ours. All this regular business is for nothing, Quinn cried in mock despair. That's my husband. <laughs> You don't know how hard we've worked. We were here six days ago, six days. Whenever I mentioned the poor progress of this particular love where you live experiment, people threw out ideas for making ourselves memorable. Leave a big tip, recommended my friend Megan. At the bagel, bagel shop where she once worked, a customer regularly tipped $20 and we used to fight over who got to serve him. Proportionately, a $20 tip on a bagel would translate to around $165 on a dinner at Lefty's. That was practice, practically MC Hammer level money. Weird, not to mention unaffordable. Quinn and I stuck with a trying to be generous 25% with no noticeable reaction. Chat up the waitress, advised our friend Neil, who himself possessed a preternatural ability to befriend service workers. The next time we went to Lefty's, I managed this much repartee with the waitress. How's it going? You seem really busy tonight. Then the forced conviviality fell apart. Squeezing out conversational bon mots every time the waitress refilled our water glasses left me feeling tense and drained. It also irked the guy at my table. I'm on a date with you, Quinn said. I don't want to talk to the waitress. As the idea that we would ever have anything like a third place experience at Lefty's dissolved, going there for dinner, again, began to feel like a whole lot of bother for nothing. Were we really regulars if the only people who knew about it were us? Couldn't we skip it and go somewhere else this once? And yet eating at the same restaurant week after week, I found myself studying the minutia that make a restaurant what it is, the regular additions and subtractions to the chalk wall menu, the dark wood tables left over from the building's fried fish platter days the stack of mismatched coffee cups by the bathroom. One night we sat at the bar, another recommendation for becoming regulars, and got an insider's view of the chef and sous chef in the minuscule kitchen, frying and ladling, swerving and avoiding collisions. In a Florida State University study of third places, 38% of coffee shop regulars hardly ever spoke to anyone. They sat alone, content to see familiar strangers, a modicum of social interaction, sometimes just, can I take your order, was all that was required for their existence as a member of the community to be confirmed. Perhaps I thought being recognized didn't matter as much as doing the recognizing. So what if I ordered the same chicken cashew sandwich five times in a row and an employee didn't congratulate me on my steadfastness? I could still enjoy feeling like it was my sandwich the same way I could still feel, still feel like this was my restaurant. All over this country are would-be third places, not just coffee shops and diners, <clears throat> but potlucks, bean suppers, church dinners, and chili cook-offs that can make us feel like we belong where we live. During the summer, the Blacksburg Ruritan Club hosts a monthly fish fry at a church off Mount Tabor Road, $8 for all you can eat, white fish, fries, lemonade, and slices of homemade cake. 
You load up a foam plate, then sit at crowded picnic tables while the community band plays. Once at the fish fry, my daughter Ruby spotted a girl that she'd met at a concert in the park a few days earlier. Can I go play with her? She cried. When we nodded, she dashed off. I wish it were that easy for adults. I tap one of the old ladies in a windbreaker and say, want to be my friend? Instead, I contented myself with being among familiar strangers, eating good food. Um, the thing that I realize uh, as I'm reading that is a lot of how we feel about our community comes down to our willingness to engage in it, even if people aren't engaging back sometimes. Our willingness to support small businesses, to show up at community events, to eat at the local restaurants, to feel like you are a part of your town's survival. I think a lot of us felt that more, um, maybe more this past year than we ever have. We have a sense now, perhaps, of what can be lost when we don't take care of our communities. One of the things I learned while writing the book is that every day we vote with our dollars what we want our town to look like. We choose where to spend our money, where to live. Um, one of the things that, I, uh, that came out of research around place attachment, too, is that Towns with a community that is really place attached tend to do better economically. They have higher levels of GDP. And again, that goes back to this idea that people who are place attached act differently. Uh, they're more likely to invest, more likely to shop at local uh, stores, to eat at local restaurants, to buy real estate, to start a business even. So in these hard times, if we want our towns to survive and bounce back, we have to invest in them. It's been hard over the course of the past year, um, hard to shop at places, hard to go, at the, go to the library even. Places haven't been open um, and maybe you've been worried about your own health and haven't wanted to go out. Thank goodness for meetings like this that allow us to be together even when we're apart. But as things start to come back to normal, fingers crossed, hopefully in the next few months, um, we have a choice. How much are we going to work to make our towns survive and thrive? Before we open it, it up for questions, <laughs> I want to read one last thing from my book um, that I hope will help you think about your own your own levels of place attachment where you live. So this is a, a place attachment quiz I include early in the book. And these are just kind of, um, this is not scientific. <laughs> I am not a scientist, um, but it's based on this idea that when we're place attached, we feel and experience certain things in our community. And this can kind of be uh, a sign to you about how well you're doing in your town. Um, so number one, I feel like I belong in this community Two, I've, I know a lot of people here three, I know my way around Four, the friendships and associations I have with other people in this town mean a lot to me. Five, I like to tell people about where I live. Six, if I could live anywhere in the world, I would live here. That's a hard one, maybe. <laughs> Seven, if something exciting were happening in this community, I'd want to be involved. Eight, and this one feels important. My town isn't perfect, but there are a lot of things that make me love it. Nine, the people who live here are my kind of people. And 10, it feels like home. Um, I know where I live, it has become harder and harder for some people to feel like it's home. Uh, and, and especially maybe to feel like the people who live here are my kind of people. We become more divided as communities. And sometimes that makes it hard for us to feel like we really belong because we see in, in relief how different other people believe from, from what we believe. Um, but I tend to feel that when we choose 
to love our communities in spite of their flaws, to try and connect with people who live where we live, even when they don't agree with us. That is how we create that sense of being at home, that deep-seated place attachment that makes us feel like this is where I belong. This is my place. These are my people. There's nowhere else I'd rather be. Um, there's a couple items on this quiz that I didn't read, including um, I was born and raised here and I've lived here a long time. If you're one of those people, chances are really good that you are deeply place attached. But I've learned from my own experience uh, that you don't have to be born and raised in a place to come to love it and to feel like it's yours. While I was writing the book, there was uh, this moment of panic because my husband wasn't super happy with his job and he decided um, that he might have to go back on the job market. And for us, that had always meant moving. I envisioned that I might have this book coming out about settling down in a community and feeling like it's home and I would have to tell people actually, I don't live in Blacksburg anymore. We, you know, we relocated to Minnesota or wherever. Luckily it didn't work out like that. My husband found a another job in Blacksburg and um, we've stayed and we have built our own home, home here and we're really happy. But I think if that did happen um, and right now we're, we're in a point of time where a lot of people aren't tied to places by their jobs and they can choose to go almost anywhere where they um, anywhere they want, I think the the tools that I learned uh, doing love where you, where I live experiments and hopefully that you've learned doing some of them yourself are are transferable. There's there are things that we can do wherever we live. A commitment we make to our place and to the people in it, um, and those are are things that make us fall in love with wherever we end up. Um, so thanks so much for listening to that. Um, I am happy to share that message with you, which feels even more important um, in our chaotic times lately. And I am happy to answer any questions that you have. I think um, we're, we're posting them maybe in the comments on YouTube or um, I'm not totally sure how it's going, but I am open to whatever you want to know. So you can post any of your comments on YouTube chat and I will pose those questions to you, Melody. Um, we do have a few questions coming up. I wanted to thank you for talking about COVID. I know when we started this program, it was in January of 2020. And in this part of Canada, in March, everything closed, the library closed. So all of these events I thought we would have, we weren't having. Um, we did post online, but once we went to online, it was harder to um, follow that conversation. And um, our first meeting, I think we had 50 or so who came to the library. We met, we had really good conversations and we shared some of the experiences we were having um, and then it went to uh, social media. So social media posts, which changed the, um, the group as well. So I'm hoping today some of that, that group is still with us. And I hope that there's um, some new people who have, have come in. But I was really worried that this whole program would die in March. <laughs> and it was odd because some of the, um, the good advice that you have in the book on becoming more attached actually still really worked like um, shopping local. It was trickier, but there were ways to do it. And definitely why that was so important um, became apparent. I mean, we had shops closing. We had, we had people in the community who were really affected by closures. Um, also being a good neighbor, that was the one that just tore at my heart because I was thinking if I had done this, you know, before COVID, I might have had those relationships um, in 2020 mm. that I didn't have because I hadn't formed them. You know, you know, I didn't know who my next door neighbor was. So I didn't know if my next door neighbor needed help or um, in what way I could help my neighbor. 
But we did, you know, continue and we tried in, you know, a social distance way to continue with the challenges. Uh, we took most of the challenges we copied from your book and we just um, changed them to be more specific for, for Red Deer in this community. Um, anyway, I, I know that a number of people have had the question, are there any adaptations you would make to some of your good advice for some of the challenges that we're still facing where we are? We're still facing some closures. Yeah, and we are too. It feels like it's it's just been back and forth all year, kind of like maybe we'll open and now we're, we're closed again. Um, but someone asked me early in the pandemic if, you know, what would I change about the love where you live experiments, um, you know, in our current COVID situation. So I started going through the book and seeing what I had recommended. And clearly there are things that just aren't happening right now or, or just don't work. You know, one of the things that I did uh, when I was, when I was trying to fall in love with Blacksburg was go to a town festival. You know, we have a, a festival called Steppin' Out and it's one of those things where, you know, we close the streets and there's booths and art and food. And it's just the kind of thing where everyone gets together in one place and you really feel like, I am part of this community and that, you know, those kinds of things weren't happening anymore. Um, but like you said, it's surprising how much did sort of transfer. Um, you know, maybe you can't go sit down in a restaurant like I did with lefties. Um, I I'm nostalgic reading that part, you know, like, Oh, remember when we had waiters and you could just be inside a restaurant. It was normal. Um, but you can get takeout and you can choose, you know, when, when COVID started, I made a list of all the locally owned restaurants in town that I thought might be in trouble because of it. And, you know, we made a point of ordering takeout from different restaurants a couple times a week, just, you know, more than maybe we normally would have just to be supportive of them. And it's interesting that you mentioned about neighbors, one of the stories that I tell in the book is um, about a study done by a guy named Daniel Aldrich. He researched tsunamis in Japan, which bear with me, it, it relates. Um, he, he looked at the 2011 tsunami that hit Japan and he would see in these coastal cities that survival rates ranged between, you know, uh, 90% and 100%, a 10% difference in the number of, you know, the percent of residents who died in a community because of the tsunami. And he wanted to know what made that difference. Was it having seawalls or was it an early warning system? And what he realized that was that for most of these towns, the difference was neighborliness, that when people had strong relationships with their neighbors, they were more likely to help neighbors to safety. You know, they had enough time, about 45 minutes warning, and that was enough time to get to the top of the hill if you were able-bodied and young, but maybe not enough time if you were elderly or in a wheelchair or pregnant. But in towns that, that had high levels of social connection, people helped their neighbors get out. And the reason what you said made me think of that is because... Uh, the researcher noted that you can't develop those kinds of relationships when the tsunami is coming. They have to already exist. So he called it the Mr. Rogers approach to, to survival. <laughs> um, and I, I think we saw that, especially in the early days of the pandemic. I actually wrote a story for a website called Livability about ways that neighbors were, were helping each other. <clears throat> and some of it was really simple, like, you know, leaving a note on your neighbor's door saying, you know, I'm so-and-so, I'm willing to go to the grocery store for you. Let, let me know if you need anything. Um, I had a, a friend here in town who woke up one morning, she went out to get her mail and uh, one of her neighbors had tied helium balloons to all the mailboxes on the street just anonymously, but it was just kind of, a, I don't know, a joyous thing to do, a way to share that we're all in this together. People were putting notes in their windows and signs. Um, I, I heard about another group that uh, did 
before the pandemic, they would do porch parties in their neighborhood where people would, you know, every Sunday afternoon at 3 p.m., I'm going to host a porch party, just come hang out on my front porch. And it was a way to connect with neighbors. And when COVID started, you know, obviously that wasn't a good idea anymore, but they developed instead the five o'clock wave. (laughs) So, you know, everyone's locked down in their house and all the neighbors would just go out onto their porches at five o'clock and they would just wave at each other, um, you know, kind of shout across the street, how are you doing? So I think a lot of the things that the ideas behind the love where you live experiments translate. Um, And and I think some of the love where you live experiments maybe became even more vital and and important during COVID. I had a whole section on connecting with nature and how that can make us feel connected to our place. That, uh, at least around here, and I imagine where you live too, that became really big this summer, you know, taking hikes, spending time outside. Um, It was the one way we could be with friends, but also it felt like um, this is how we experience our town now when we can't do big events and concerts and things like that. We're just quietly in nature, um, but it helps us appreciate where we live and it builds that sense of place attachment. Thank you. To continue, because that is on our mind, I have a question. How have your third places changed since the pandemic began? Are you still connecting with places that aren't home or work while being stuck at home? Goodness, what a great question. Um, And I I think I honestly have to say, not really. I would say that the library was one of my main third places. And I'm not just saying that because um, I'm, I'm speaking in a library program, but for me, the library has always been, you know, when I move to a new town, it's the first thing I do. I go and get my library card. I feel like this is my place (laughs) and these are my people. And I would um, you know, I'm a freelance writer and most of the time I work from home, but I would go work in the library and, it was very much a place where I spent a lot of time and our library is closed right now. Um, They are open for holds and they will bring your books out to you, which is great. That's Um, the same in Red Deer. Yeah. So, um, but we can actually go in the building and, and I miss it, but I, I find that what matters more to me right this second um, is I guess I would say like being in the vicinity of, of places that are important to me, um, maybe not going inside, but um, spending time near them. So I live about a mile from my library and it is very often on my daily walk circuit that I just walk to the library and walk home. Um, I, I still get holds there, you know, every few days, um, actually. And, um, it still feels like part of my life, even though I can't go inside. I also, um, in the book, I talk about volunteering at the Lyric, which is the movie theater. And for a while I'd stopped doing that, you know, I got busy and, and I just wasn't going anymore. Um, and the Lyric closed during, the first several months of COVID and then reopened with, you know, safety procedures, minimal seating, things like that. And since about June, my daughter and I, uh, my 13 year old and I have been volunteering there once a week. We are the Monday night concession shift. (laughs) So we go and and we serve up popcorn. It's also free popcorn night. So if anyone wants to come visit us um, in Blacksburg, Monday night at the Lyric, be there. Um, and, and so that has even more maybe than before has become a third place for me, a place where I, I enjoy spending time. We kind of like shoot the breeze with the manager and the other volunteers, um, and all wearing masks, of course. Um, it is hard, you know, it it feels like our relationship with our places is changed because of this COVID year. But in some ways, it's maybe made us, you know, appreciate our places more in a different way. But you have a sense that you're 
your places have shrunk a little, right? Um, we're, we're not traveling as much. Um, we are kind of in this little bubble in our community. And while I confess to feeling a certain restlessness and being eager to, you know, get out again, it's also made me feel kind of a closeness with, with my town, with the people in it and, and the places. That's, that's a good segue into the next question, which is loving where you live seems even more timely now with less travel. Were there any new experiences that you had during quarantine that in your town you may not have otherwise thought of? Wow, what a, a great question. Um, kind of, re- so yeah, <laughs> I, I will say that um, I, I mentioned walking before and I mentioned nature. So I hope this isn't too much of the same thing. But I certainly started spending far more time hiking um, during during the pandemic and hiking alone, to be specific. I think I always thought of hiking as something you have to do with big groups of friends. It's an event. <laughs> um, and I, I had a, you know, my 18 year old was often my hiking buddy and she graduated from high school and she went off on a gap year. And uh, it, it was kind of an awkward time to get friends together. And so I, I started hiking by myself. Um, there's a place about 10 minutes out of town called Pandapas Pond. I write about it in the book. Um, And I started going there every, every couple of days just by myself and, you know, doing like a, you know, not a super long strenuous hike, but just maybe like a three and a half mile loop. And it was really transformative. I'm not sure that I would have done it um, in non COVID times because I, I, I would have done it with friends. Um, you know, maybe I would have gone hiking, but I would have done it with a bigger group of people. And it was interesting to have that experience of being in a place by myself. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is my town pivoted a little to support restaurants. They closed a downtown street to traffic and they put a, a big canopy and picnic tables there. And the idea was that people could go to the local restaurants and then bring their food out and eat it at the picnic tables. And outdoor eating became a much bigger part of my life during the pandemic. I'm not sure if that's the same in your town, Um, but it was um, this place that the town sort of just invented uh, for COVID purposes but that people love so much, I think it will stay. Um, it, so it was it was an interesting new way to experience my community, like eating in the middle of a downtown street where there had never been tables before. Your move to Blacksburg, Virginia is the center of your book. What kind of reactions have you had from the people in Blacksburg about being in your book? <laughs> That's an awesome question. Um, Honestly, (laughs) before the book came out, I was really nervous about what the reaction would be. Um, Part of that was just, I wasn't sure if they would think I had gotten things right. Even simple things (laughs) like I say in the book that Blacksburg is in the Blue Ridge Mountains. but the Blue Ridges are part of the Appalachian Mountains. And I wasn't sure, was I saying, are, are we really in the Blue Ridge Mountains? Um, you know, just little pieces of, of town history. You're, you're kind of analyzing your community a little and describing, you know, things like football really matters. Maybe that is not a contentious statement in, in my town, but I worried, I genuinely worried um, that there would be a lot of backlash somehow. But People have been so encouraging and supportive. Um, The book came out in 2016 and we decided to throw a launch party for it in town at the Alexander Black Historic Home, which is, um, you know, 
the home of one of the earlier founders of Blacksburg, this big Victorian mansion and it's, and it's downtown and um, the people who run it gave it to us for free for the afternoon. We had games and like quizzes and, um, and it was super fun. And I think that is representative of the reception I've gotten um, in general. So there's also people who have never read the book and have no idea that, you know, there's this thing out there that talks really specifically about their place. But I do also hear often from people who are moving to Blacksburg that, you know, this is either something they found before they got here um, or something that was maybe given to them when they arrived and people feel you know, obviously it's a very specific guide if you're actually living in Blacksburg, you know, do these things. Uh, but people feel kind of seen, you know, like that. I know that place. Um, I, I have actually, you know, been to that restaurant or whatever. Um, it seems to make people happy. So <laughs> it's been fun. One of the things in the book um, that you recommend is to attend events. We have a question does it matter who runs the community events? Are they more effective by the town or charities or both? That's an interesting thing to consider. Um, I I think both can be effective. The thing that I have, um, you know, there's this moment in the book uh, where I talk about trying to sort of start my own community event. Um, that That felt like, you know, the final step on the ladder of my place attachment is I am going to run a community event. And the the event I chose was a sidewalk chalk festival. We had been to one when we lived in Texas that was this really epic affair. And I'm like, we're going to do that here in Blacksburg. And, and I really gave it a good effort. (laughs) I, you know, tried to gather a group of people who were interested in art and the town. And, you know, we made plans. And um, then I realized that maybe I'm not cut out to run community (laughs) events. Um, And we scaled it way back. It ended up being more like um, a, a sidewalk chalk activity at a farmer's market. Um, and, And that was okay. For a long time, I really thought, gosh, I, I failed on that. Um, and I actually was doing a speaking event. and was kind of telling that story and the people in the audience were like, you didn't fail. Like this was, this was important for your growth and you did the best you could. I'm like, okay. Um, so I, I think, um, either towns or charities or community groups can successfully run events. We have examples of, um, all of those in our community, the um, the town uh, partners with groups like the Main Street Organization to run things like Stepping Out. We also have like the Kiwanis Club runs a big chocolate festival every year that has become popular. The thing that I really love to see in towns is when local government leaders and maybe also, you know, nonprofit and community group leaders open themselves up to inviting people who may not normally get involved in these kinds of events. I learned from my experience that, you know, not everyone is cut out to run a community event, but there are a lot of people in our towns who have great ideas for things like these and they just don't feel connected enough to make it happen or they don't know who to talk to or they don't know the mayor or they don't have any money. Um, I, I've seen towns do things like micro grants where you submit an idea for you know either an event or a, a piece of public art or something like that and the town will give you a thousand dollars to to help you make it happen. And I love things like that, that make sort of the average person feel like they have a voice in their community. So if the question was, you know, maybe the question was like, how do we go about this? Who should be organizing things? Um, And Perhaps the question is because I have an idea and, um, you know, where do I go? I, I hope that everyone feels a little more empowered to, you know, 
contact a local group or a city leader and say, you know, let's make the sidewalk chalk festival happen or what have you. I think the more, the more voices we allow in our communities, the more people we can involve and get engaged and get on board, uh, the better our communities are. And it certainly increases place attachment for the people who are making those events happen. I have another question for you. So for myself, the most challenging chapter for me was the one where we were challenged to create something. For you, what did you find was the most challenging chapter of, you know, challenges that you had to set off and try? Well, it probably was the create something (laughs) chapter because, um, yeah, that was when I tried to do this sidewalk chalk festival and just felt like I had gotten in over my head. Um, all, the, the section that I read about trying to become a, a regular at a local restaurant was also one of the, the bigger fails <laughs> in, in my um, experiments. Um, and I think that's okay. Um, I, you know, I share lots of ideas for different love where you live experiments. I tried to organize it. So every chapter is kind of like the broad overarching theme of, you know, spend time in nature. And here's, um, you know, 10, 10 ways that might look for you, you know, maybe it's hiking or maybe it's camping or, you know, here are different things that you can do. And so, I think it's probably natural that we all have that stuff that this just isn't my thing, you know? And, um, you know, I talk a lot about shopping at local businesses and supporting local restaurants. There are probably people who are just like, you know, I, I always cook for myself and I've eaten at a restaurant once in the past five years. And, you know, that is fine. (laughs) You know, like that is, is your life. So I hope that, the takeaway for people is find the thing that works for you. Find, um, you know, find the thing that connects you to your community. I will say that um, in general, I'm a pretty big introvert. And um, one of the things I discovered while researching the book and talking to people is the absolute paramount importance of friends where you live knowing other people. Sometimes those are loose tie relationships, like what I described at the restaurant, you know, you just know that waiter and they know your name and you have this feeling of belonging because of that. Um, And it might be getting to know your neighbors and it might be, you know, developing deeper friendships. So you have someone to hang out with on the weekend. And sometimes those things are hard for me too. I'm, I'm, you know, I think I'm a friendly person, but I also um, am am pretty okay with not a ton of social interaction, and I can be a little shy. So I have a, a friend here in Blacksburg who moved here around the same time I did. I, I quote her in the book. Her name is Christy, and she was kind of sharing some ideas for how she made connections when she moved to Blacksburg. She would talk to everyone, you know, like waiters or people at the farmer's market, tell me, you know, what do you like to do here in Blacksburg? You know, what are your favorite restaurants? And it is such a great piece of advice. And I'm like, that works for Christy because she is so outgoing and it maybe doesn't work as well for someone like me. Um, And again, we're we're all different. We have to find the right approach to our town. So um, I think, you know, being introvert, introverted makes it slightly harder to build those social relationships that really matter to place attachment. But I've, you know, in eight and a half years, I've found workarounds and I I don't have to talk to strangers at the farmer's market to, to feel like I love my place. Um, Your book has been compared to uh, Gretchen Rubin's The Happiness Project. Have you read her book? And what do you think of this comparison? <laughs> I have read her book. Um, and I'm very flattered by the comparison. She is super successful. Um, and I would, yeah, it, it would be a great thrill to, um, 
to write books like Gretchen Rubin. I think the thing that we have in common is kind of this very practical approach to happiness. Her book is, you know, these easy things that you can do to make yourself marginally happier. You know, these aren't super massive life-changing things, but they're, they're small things um, like getting organized or, you know, going on dates with your husband or whatever that make you feel a little happier. And I feel like that was the approach I wanted to take in this is where you belong that, you know, here, here's a list, you know, here are some really mostly small practical things that you can do in your town that may have a, a surprising impact on how you feel where you live. So, you know, I talk about place attachment, but really it's happiness. It is finding happiness where you live, being content in your community, feeling like you have supportive relationships and all of that kind of adds up to a general sense of well-being in your life. And I think that for most of us, even if, you know, our gut feeling isn't always super positive about our town, I think most of us can can do these small things that sort of incrementally change our own level of happiness in our community. They add to our feeling of, of um, well-being where we live. And as I point out in the book, you know, being happy and healthy where you live um, is the same thing as being happy and healthy in your life. You know, like if you're just a happy, healthy person, probably you will feel good in your community as well. So um, yeah, it's just ways to make yourself feel a little happier. Um, one of the quotes that I really liked in your book was um, a friend of yours sharing the advice to unpack your life wherever you are. She said she had taken it to heart, even unpacking at hotels, because when you live out of a suitcase, you are only marking time and you will be miserable because you can only think of what was or what might've been or fear what is to come. For anyone who hasn't read the book, would you share what you think she meant by that? Yeah, so this is my friend, Jen. Um, she actually died a couple months ago of breast cancer. So it feels a little poignant um, to hear her, her quote. Um, she was a military spouse. Her husband was in the army and they found themselves moving regularly and without much say in the matter. You know, the, the US military just kind of says, you now live in Texas, <laughs> you know, now two years later, we're moving you to Kansas. So she found herself in lots of places that she never intended to be, but someone had given her that piece of advice, unpack your suitcase. And what I think she took it to mean and what I take it to mean is that no matter how long you think you're going to be in a place or how much you hate it when you get there, you have to invest. You have to settle in and decide for as long as I'm here, this is, this is my place. And I saw her do that over and over again. Um, she, she was my childhood friend, but, uh, so I mostly in these later years had contact with her on social media and I would see people from so many different places that she had lived, different towns that she'd spent time in that she was friends with online. And it reminds me that, um, you know, one of the things that we do in communities is we develop relationships and we take those relationships with us wherever we go, the impact of the places that we've lived, the things we've experienced and then especially the people that we've met along the way are things that change us as people and they hopefully make us better. And, and then if we come to the day when we're moving on or they've moved on, that impact remains. So I think um, I, I, I saw that in Jen that she fell in love with wherever she happened to be. I remember when she moved to upstate New York, 
She did not want to go. <laughs> this was, you know, not her dream move. Uh, but she would post pictures of how great the local lake was that she would take her kids to swim in. Or can you believe this great small community that has this little 4th of July parade that is so awesome? And she just committed herself to finding, <coughs> excuse me, finding what was lovable and what was good about wherever she happened to be. And I, I love that. I think that is a lesson that, you know, I, I try to take into my own life and that I hope other people do that, um, you know, no matter where you are, no matter how long you expect to be there, learn to love what's around you, appreciate what's there and, and be happy with it. Even if you, even if you only think you'll be in a place for a few months or a year, that's too long to be miserable. <laughs> Find ways to, to be happy where you are right now. Thank you. Um, I'll end with, with one more question and that's about the rumors of your upcoming book. Is there a working <laughs> title? Yeah. Um, so this is called right now, at least anywhereist. Um, and it's, I, I found that after I had written This Is Where You Belong, I originally thought, you know, I'm a freelance writer. I'm used to writing about lots of different topics. I'll write this topic, this book about place and moving, and then I'll move on and I'll write something completely different. And I found that I couldn't let it go, um, that I, I've sort of become obsessed with the idea of place and how our communities affect us. So this new book, um, which... I'm writing for source books. It will come out in 2022. Um, the idea is to explore uh, what happens when you can live anywhere, which is a situation that a lot more of us have found ourselves in because of the pandemic. People are, you know, going remote in their work, and a lot of people are trying to make that decision. If I can work anywhere, where should I live? And so this is meant to be um, a guide to help people answer that question and think about how our places affect our, our finances, our careers, our success and our happiness. So um, I think the basic message that you can be happy anywhere is, is the same. I think people can create happiness in almost any community, but I also think that people do move, they choose places and they're, certain things that may be helpful to consider as you're making those choices. So that is hopefully what the new book will do. Well, we'll be looking forward to it. And thank you for all of your practical and positive advice. Um, just take a moment to say that if anyone wasn't aware of the Dear Reggie program, which is coming to an end, we still have, you know, all of the book lists, all of the references, all of the community links, if you have any questions, you can contact Regia Public Library, www.rdpl.org about this program or upcoming programs. And just a reminder that this book can be borrowed from the library or bought at a local bookstore. And uh, thank you so much for taking part in this conversation and for sparking the um, conversation that this community has had based on your book. Thank you. Thank you so much for choosing my book um, and choosing where you live. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. And it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you.